Hi there, I'm Mabel Chan, and this is One in a Billion. If you've spent years studying and working in science and technology, making good money, and making your parents proud, why on earth would you change career? In the end, I think you just really try to calm down and listen to yourself and try to figure out what makes you happy. Sometimes I would try to imagine when I'm old and dying. When I look back at my life, what will make me feel proud? That's how Wu, a Chinese American molecular biologist turned internet executive, turned documentary filmmaker. In our last episode, I talked with Hao about China's live streaming business in his award-winning documentary, The People's Republic of Desire. It's a film about money, fame, and human desires for love, belonging, and respect. Now, we focus on Hao's personal story, his life and career in China, and the pursuit of happiness in America. In our episode today, this Chinese life, the pursuit of happiness. You grew up in Sichuan Province, China, and you were trained as a molecular biologist in the University of Science and Technology of China, which is、That's、a、right. national research university in Hefei. Anhui, that's right, right,、yeah. and that's under the auspices of the Chinese Academy of Science, which is a part of China's equivalence of the Ivy League, right? Am I right? You were a scholar. Yeah, you were intellectual. Like, <laughs> it's like China's MIT or Caltech. That's huge. And then, and then you moved into the internet world, working for Alibaba, before focusing on filmmaking. So,、yeah. this is the question. How would you begin to tell us the story of these career choices and big moves in your life? I mean, traversing three different worlds: biology, technology, media. Not to mention China and U.S. So I guess it's almost like a compulsion. I mean, anybody who make very difficult career choices or life choices, I think in the end it's not because we make. These choices, in the end, it's usually those choices chose us. When I was growing up in Chengdu in Sichuan Province, I was、uh, equally attracted to sciences and humanities, you know, the liberal arts.、Um, but you know, being Chinese、um, and also growing up in China in the eighties and nineties, one usually was pushed into sciences if you can. You know, if you get good grades in those fields,、mm-hmm. so that's why I went to university, studied molecular biology. But then, I think deep down, emotionally, spiritually, I always find that unsatisfying.、Hmm. And it took a long time for me to really be able to tell myself what I want to do is to express myself through、mm-hmm. stories. Mm-hmm. Because in between, I went to business school at the University of Michigan.、Oh. That's how I got into Silicon Valley, the tech, the part of management, tech management. But even though I loved it, you know, I'm the kind of person who's always optimistic to some degree and、uh, enjoy what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis. But deep down, like I said earlier, it was not satisfying enough. Right. I started doing writing and picking up the camera. Started filming. That's how I got into filmmaking. Wow! I will ask you that question、uh, a little bit later. But since you mentioned University of Michigan and business school, so let me just ask you: Was there a business or entrepreneurial background in your childhood? No. I mean, basically, I came to the U.S. as a PhD student in molecular biology. I decided not to finish my PhD degree. Uh, and just left science after a master's program, but then I didn't know what I wanted to do. Where were you then? then? I was in Boston, actually. I went to grad school at Brandeis University, also in Boston. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And you know, as a Chinese immigrant, and what you wanted to do, a lot of time by default, right? You want to be quote unquote successful. So my friends were pursuing law degrees.、Mm-hmm. Some of them go, went to medical schools. I decided to go. To business school, so these are a lot of the immigrant family approved professions. <laughs> you were seeking <laughs> approval. You were in your twenties.、Right. I was in my twenties. So you got into business school, and then what?、Uh, at what point did you feel the pull 
of storytelling. I was and, doing storytelling the whole time. I was reading a lot, trying to do some writing.、Mm-hmm. It kind of never stopped because I never grew up with any artist、mm-hmm. or have any friends who have moved into any artistic fields. I, it never occurred to me that、uh, doing anything unrelated to science, business, law, or medicine could be made into a career. So back in 2003, I met some filmmakers, and they're like, "If you are interested, just pick up the camera, and start filming." So I started doing filmmaking purely as a hobby. So you were filming、uh, on the side, and then you were doing what during the day? I started my tech career in Silicon Valley with Excite at Home.、Mm-hmm. For the older people, they may remember that, that that website. And then I moved to Earthlink in LA.、Uh, so that's where I started doing some filmmaking. In 2004, I moved back to China. I really want to give filmmaking a full-time try.、Uh, so I did full-time filmmaking for a year and a half. I moved back into tech, working for Alibaba at Yahoo China, but still doing filmmaking on the side. Were you in Hangzhou for、uh, both companies, or in Beijing, or where were you?、Uh, in Beijing and、ah. Hangzhou. Oh, okay,、both. right. Yeah, and and then 2000, beginning of 2012, I just quit my. Job and decided to do filmmaking full time. Now you made it sound so easy. I mean, you landed a job at Alibaba and in Yahoo. What made it so easy for you? Was it easy? I guess it was relatively easy back then for someone. What period of time、uh, are we talking about? What year would that be? I joined Alibaba 2007. So for someone with a good Western education,、uh, with、uh, Western internet experience. Um, even today, I think it's still relatively easy to get a decent position、mm-hmm. with one of the big tech companies in China. You think so? Or anywhere?、Mm-hmm. Yeah,、mm-hmm. I think so.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, even nowadays. Yeah. So back then, there probably there was a greater need for talent.、Mm-hmm. So it wasn't that difficult for me to get a job at、uh, Alibaba. What was your role at Alibaba, and and what, what point did you decide to leave, and why? So I started with Yahoo China in Beijing. Back then, Yahoo China, I think, was just purchased by Alibaba. So I was coordinating the transfer of, of advertising technology and know-how from Yahoo US into the Alibaba Group, and、uh, I also helped、uh, set up Alibaba、uh, first ad exchange.、Um, but、uh, I, I really enjoy working for Alibaba. It's a very unique Chinese company, internet company.、Mm-hmm. Uh, but then in 2008, they moved me from Beijing to Hangzhou, and.、Uh, I was making a documentary on the side in Beijing. Then, after that move, every weekend I would fly from Hangzhou to Beijing to continue filming.、Uh, after a while, I was like, "This is not sustainable."、Film. What were you filming at the time?、Uh, so that film was called "The Road to Fame." It's about kids and China's top acting school for their graduation showcase. They did the American musical "Fame"、oh. by working, collaborating with、uh, with Broadway. And、uh, so I was filming every weekend. I would fly back. There's,、uh, it was too difficult for me to handle both. So as always, I made the choice to pursue my art, the more important uh, priority uh, compared to my business money making、uh, career. So I decided to take the job with TripAdvisor, which is setting up its、uh, China operation in Beijing. That's the only reason I left Alibaba. You need to position yourself where you are filming a lot. That's right. You know、yeah. where your heart is. You need to part yourself where your heart is <laughs> to finish the、yeah. film. So location is very important. At some point, you decided to join New America as a fellow. What's that about? Is that a detour or a retreat, no, I mean, a leap into the unknown? No, I mean the fellowship was just、uh, that supporting my work. So in 2012, I decided to take a break. From a tech career to finish that film, and then I will go back to tech. But、uh, I gave myself six months to finish editing the Road to Fame. But the six months turned into a year,、mm-hmm. turned into a year and a half.、Mm-hmm. By the end of it, I realized I really enjoy doing this full time.、Mm-hmm. So I decided not to go back to tech and continue to make documentary film, which led to People's Republic of Desire. Right. New America was just a, a fellowship that supported my filmmaking. Now explain the thought process. At what point did you think or believe, I should say, that filmmaking can be a full-time job, career, commitment? It's more about 
I'm not willing to let go the traditional definition of success because I was considered to be successful back in China. I was making very good money. I travel in style. I made my parents happy. But making a documentary, you would never make a lot of money. If you can support yourself, you can live, get by.、Mm-hmm. You count yourself lucky. But I think it just there. There was a lot of soul searching for a number of years, going back and forth. Should I go back to the tech world, or should I not? But in the end, I tried to calm down and listen to yourself and trying to figure out. What makes you happy? So you know, sometimes I would try to imagine when I'm old and dying. When I look back at my life, what will make me feel proud? Right. That kind of thought experiment. Legacy.、Um, yeah, I mean, just like being proud, I have done created something beautiful. I see a lot of friends going through their midlife crisis, doing soul searching as well. The only advice I can give them is that be patient with yourself. Sooner or later, you will be able to find your. Your true voice, what you really, really want, just for yourself,、right. not for anybody else. In your soul searching, do you have conversation with your parents or your siblings? Did you involve them in your reflection before you make that big leap to to go into filmmaking? No, I mean,、Whoa. in some ways, I'm I'm not a good Chinese son in the sense that I don't listen to my parents. I usually do what. I believe it's the right right thing to do.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I'm lucky in that way、mm. because if you care too much how your parents think of you, it's gonna make your own decision making for your own life that much more complicated. Yes, yes, yes. But、um, do they understand you? No, they still don't. I'm making. A, I made a film for Netflix. It's a 40-minute short called "All in My Family" about my journey to have kids through surrogacy and building a LGBT family in the U.S.、Oh. How my how my family in China reacts to that.、Right. So it's gonna it's gonna start streaming on Netflix in May. In that film, audience will be able to see how my parents truly think about me.、Wow. That I'm such a rebel that had broken their heart with two things: one, being gay. Secondly, you know, pursuing documentary filmmaking, not making money. But you reached a level of success、uh, financially and traditionally, so you have met that sort of expectation of Chinese parents of their only son. Am I right that you have reached that level of success to make them proud of you? Yeah, I guess in some ways that make them even more frustrated. They're like, "You can't do this. You can't make money. You can't make us proud. Why are you giving this all up for、hmm. documentary filmmaking?" They truly don't understand. So after a while, I just stop explaining. I feel like this is there's a big generational gap. Try to bridge that gap. It's almost impossible.、Mm-hmm. I guess my philosophy now is that we can continue to love each other. Right. We can. Respect our differences, and、mm-hmm. you know, I don't aim to co- erase that difference. Right, you don't aim to convert them, and you, they probably have stopped thinking or hoping they can convert you. They haven't stopped. Oh, <laughs> they, they haven't. They are more persistent still, than you. <laughs> yeah, they're still trying.、Mm-hmm. Every time they see me, they will ask, "So why is、uh, when you gonna stop doing films and go back to make real money?"、Mm-hmm. Now you you are embarking on a new chapter. You've recently been signed up by CAA, the Creative Artists Agency. Yeah, that's right. Congratulations! Oh, thank you. Yeah, how yeah. did that come about? Tell us more about it. Oh,、uh, yeah, I just think some of the agents,、uh, CAA agents, actually in China, they watched my film at the film festival in China. They just loved it.、Oh, um, I'm happy for you. Yeah, and also I think the Chinese maybe entertainment industry. They're still growing really fast. They're looking for talents who can tell stories. So yeah, I'm working with CAA to explore opportunities、uh, in both China and the US here. So what's next for you? Do you know yet? I'm in the research phase because the Netflix short is coming out pretty soon. So preparing some marketing and press stuff for them. I'm reading some scripts and、uh, trying preparing both documentary and narrative film projects. I see. Is there a thread that runs through the types or themes of projects that you're working on? Are you solely doing documentary? 
so far, but uh, I would like to expand more into narrative, scripted narrative uh, films, mm -hmm. um, because with documentary, there is something so precious about documentary, which is the power of truth, power mm -hmm. of true characters or true mm -hmm. emotions. At the same time, there are, there's a limit to what type of story you can tell with documentaries, mm -hmm. because the difficulty of getting access or the difficulty of convincing the characters mm -hmm. to let you film them mm -hmm. uh, so yeah I mean there are certain types of story I would like to explore especially with with regard to technology how technology is impacting our lives mm -hmm. uh, so some some of the stories will probably be better explored in a narrative format instead of documentary right so if your film projects are a thread of pearls what are some of the common themes that link them together? Uh, so far, it's a lot is about young people's aspirations and how the reality constrain those aspirations. I just have a natural affinity for coming of age stories. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm a huge fan of sci fi sort of dystopian stories. Right. Uh, because those stories make us think that's uh, human desires, human aspirations. Those are the things. I, I found fascinating. Now, you live in New York, and you hinted before you have a child. Tell me more about the balance of growing this film career and raising a child. We have two kids, so they are both precious and uh, frustrating at the same time. Mm. And uh, I, I, I'm a workaholic. I can work around the clock, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> but now with kids, kids force you to stop. Yeah. Like in the morning, there's two hours trying to get them ready for school. In the evening, there's two, three hours uh, of getting them to bed. And mm -hmm. after that, I'm usually so tired, I go to bed myself. So that just makes the work time a lot shorter. Uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I, it's not easy. Well, let me let me just pry a little bit deeper. I used to work in New York when I was single. So yeah. back in those days when I was producing for Network News in New York, I was so busy with work and also all that is uh, required to live uh, in yeah. New York. I had no mental space for a child. It never occurred to me until something later happened to me in life. But for you, how were you able to even have the mental space to think about a child? How did that occur to you? If you watch my Netflix show, you'll be able to understand it. Uh, uh, um, I guess. Well, give me a little teaser. It's a complicated story. It's really about my relationship with my parents, mm. how I feel frustrated by and constrained by them growing up, mm -hmm. how I kind of want to prove I want to have a better family. Uh, mm -hmm. being become better parents than mm -hmm. they were. And also my partner really wanted to have kids. I guess it's just at a certain age, you're just curious about what you can leave behind. You mentioned age. You, you're a father now. You have two children and our audience are 20, 30-something. What would you say to young people, 20-something, 30-something, who are struggling to distinguish themselves, right? Um, yeah. To try to balance the passion that they have, maybe artistically, creatively, and the demands and expectations, the responsibilities, the obligations to uh, be a good Chinese son or daughter. What do you say to them? What can you say to them? I think it's really hard for me to say anything. Everybody will end up with his or her own path. I just feel like for young people, the only thing I can encourage them to do more is that don't give up and keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. By doing it, I mean, don't just get frustrated by, I wish I could do this. I wish I could be that. Just start trying it. If you want to be a filmmaker, just try it. I just feel like if you keep on thinking about this, reading about this, you will find your own way mm -hmm. in the end. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And then you will grow. Mm -hmm. You will grow through this whole exploration process. Mm -hmm. And just don't be so hard on yourself. Don't get so frustrated if you don't have the answer right now. The answer will come to you. Be patient. 
In our next episode, my conversation with Mimi Wong, a Chinese American writer and editor in New York. She wrote an essay in the Catapult about Asian fatherhood after watching the film *Searching*, starring Korean American actor John Cho. Well, so much of the film really focuses in on John Cho's character's emotions as a father. He expresses a range of, you know, different feelings from anger to fear, and you see him get very sad and vulnerable too. And it was so exciting seeing. An Asian American figure express all this. That's Mimi Wong in our next episode. This Chinese life watching Asian fathers on screen helps me face my own. That's in two weeks. One in a billion is Brian Latwinowich, Yvette Yu, Maggie Shi, and our lovely theme song is composed by Brad McCarthy. Let us know if you want to join our team of volunteers. Help us plan events, pitch a story. Just go to our website, oneinabillionvoices.org, and find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Support for our podcast comes from our collaboration with the Victor and William Fung Foundation.